Hi, I'm Mary Rowe, Director of Livability and Resilience Initiatives here at the Municipal Arts Society of New York. And I'm here to talk to you about how we foster resilience through community-based innovation. Obviously, we're talking about cities. It's where the world's population is increasingly moving to. But it's also the most dynamic unit. It might even be humanity's greatest creation, cities. And the way in which we live co collectively, collaboratively, and we create fabulous kinds of innovation in urban environments. And even the ecologists like Mark and Grove are acknowledging where for many years uh, folks in the science world might have said cities are actually bad, they're actually impeding nature. What we realize now is that we're coexisting with nature. And that in fact an ecological understanding of cities as self-organizing, just like any other ecosystem, is a valuable way to understand how we are choosing to live. And a lot of the ideas that I'm going to communicate to you today are inspired by this woman, Jane Jacobs, and I hope that you will uh, finish this lecture and immediately go and Google Jane Jacobs because she's written eloquently and powerfully about these issues for decades. Resilience for us is an important concept because it works at all scales and in many, many domains. It's a hugely popular term around climate change, but it's not just about climate change. It's about how communities can self-organize their way to being more adaptive, more flexible, and it works at the individual scale. It's a term that's been used in psychology worlds forever, how I cultivate my own individual resilience, but also my household, my family, my block, my neighborhood, my district, my city. This is a concept that works at many, many scales and at many levels. And it's about that capacity to be able to proactively, productively uh, absorb shocks, but also take advantage of opportunity. It's relational. It's a mix. And there are all sorts of organic conditions that support resilience. And part of it is just a simple notion of making connections. If you think of a city as many, many different kinds of systems, built environment systems, engineering systems, natural systems, or you can think of it as capital, social capital, built environment capital, fiscal capital, cultural capital, spiritual capital, and they all interact. And in a really healthy, vibrant city, they flow back and forth, and there's all sorts of opportunity for creativity and collaboration. And another way to look at that is to talk about it as a concept of self-organization, where I am able to meet my needs and my aspirations and have agency, have the capacity and the opportunity and the resources to be able to capitalize on that. And I'm dependent on others to do that. And so part of what you see in a city is this natural tendency to form different kinds of hubs uh, around affinity, where we share an interest. It could be your faith community, could be your church, could be your community center, could be your library, could be a park. Any number of ways that we congregate and form that sense of, of reinforcing identity. And then we form links to allow us to relate to folks that are a little different than we are, and that build our capacity to cope with difference. And that's part of the dynamics of a fabulous city, this notion that we're all uh, working, self-organizing uh, opportunities that, that benefit us mutually. So part of what we say when we look at building the resilience of a city is you want to be enabling self-organization. As you see it in nature, that kind of connected organic growth that you see in nature and that you see as replicating in natural systems but also in built environment systems. So look at how the roadway breaks up. Look at how materials break up. They also have that kind of interconnected notion. Uh, and the way we plan transit routes, for instance, we want those to be adaptive and flexible and organic, just like this bus route. So part of what I want to emphasize with you is that when you, we've had an opportunity in the last number of years to observe how cities come back from certain kinds of particular challenges, but it's not restricted to cities that have had those, these kinds of challenges. Maybe they've had a natural disaster, maybe they've had some other kind of pernicious challenge, but it's also just an inherent nature of how a city forms itself and has for hundreds and hundreds and maybe thousands of years, in fact. Uh, through this concept of self-organization. So what can we do to enable that? A lot of what I'm talking to you about is informed by my experience in New Orleans post-Katrina. I was fortunate to have a number of years there to observe in an extraordinary environment how would that city and the people within it self-organize to recover. And part of what they had to deal with were these extraordinary challenges posed by um, oil and gas industry patterns that had caused all these disruptions. This is a canal that cut parts of the city away from each other. So you saw a sign like this with a neighborhood that you couldn't get to. You couldn't walk to this neighborhood. This is the bridge to the Lower Nine. And when I saw that, I was immediately challenged. How could that neighborhood have ever thrived if it had that kind of an artificial um, uh, barrier? 
and there are many of those. We have them in cities in all sorts of ways. How do we remove them? Well, after Katrina, we saw that the people of New Orleans dug their feet in and said, just a second, we are actually quite resilient. And so they started to form different kinds of hubs, as I suggested. This is Denise Thornton. She founded something called the Beacon of Hope. She opened her home, and as did her neighbors, and they became collective resource centers, like a bee and a hive. Uh, Denise created several of these. They now exist in neighborhoods across New Orleans and, in fact, in other cities that are trying to find their way and use mutual aid and collective uh, approaches to plot their own recovery. This is two other folks that were active in New Orleans. This is Patricia Jones, who worked in the Lower Nine. And who did she reach out to? Bob Berkebile, one of the great, great pioneers of green building and sustainable uh, uh, construction in the United States. And as you can see, the two of them, quite different human beings, finding a way to collectively, uh, uh, at the most local level, consider what resilience would look like in New Orleans. There were other ways that we observed in New Orleans that, again, you can see in your cities now. Social media. This is Karen Gadbois. She's an artist. She had really not used a computer before Katrina. When she came back from Katrina, her artist's eye allowed her to see the city. And what she saw were that the houses that had been so important to she and her family to be able to identify where they were, it was part of how they attached to their community, that those houses were either being demolished or just neglected. And she recognized that if the city allowed that to happen, they would be squandering their heritage. And so she started taking thousands of photographs and recruiting all sorts of other people to take those photographs. And she became what's now called an investigative journalist. She was a social media pioneer. She created a, a website uh, called the New Orleans Lens and is one of the most successful investigative journalism sites in the country. And Karen's received all sorts of awards. She came from the ground up, untrained, extraordinarily smart and insightful, helped build the resilience of the city. There are other examples of that in New Orleans. And I'm just giving these to you because it's a city that was in crisis, but they exist everywhere. This is Tim Lynn Sams, who created a network of neighborhood organizations that now talk to each other, that relationship with the other, those longer links that help hubs to be able to, to thrive. Another important piece for resilience is access to data, to actually know what's going on. And it's better, much better, if that data is owned locally and that you're not dependent on some other authority to be able to tell you what's going on in your community because you actually know. This is the Greater New Orleans Community Data Center and the pioneers there who determined and were insistent that New Orleanians own the information about their city. There are also some things that don't have anything to do with technology, good old-fashioned ways in which we build our learning and our urban literacy of what's around us. Mapping. We all do it. When I was a kid, nobody drew maps. Now, everybody draws maps. Culture. Important ways that we bridge now with other folks, that we actually know that the arts and culture are a way to interact with people that are not like us, to be able to see things differently. Very important in, in a city to contribute to its resilience. Um, how you cultivate entrepreneurship, small business, locally grown jobs, locally grown solutions. This is the idea of village in New Orleans became an extraordinarily important uh, instigator of creative, uh, imaginative approaches to create jobs and also address challenges in New Orleans. And these don't just exist in New Orleans. I'm using that example because that city had an extraordinary challenge. But these kinds of uh, examples, manifestations of self-organization at the community level are everywhere. This is Houston, a series of neighborhood centers settlement houses that actually function to welcome newcomers to Houston and now provide all sorts of opportunities for people to meet, congregate, cook food together, um, uh, learn to job skills, um, talk about poetry. Whatever their particular interest is, whatever their aspiration is, this network of centers, these exist in other cities and we need to find ways to support them to preserve these civic assets. This is one in Paris. It's called Cocosson. It's an old uh, coffin building uh, manufacturing facility that they didn't need anymore. And so what they did is they turned it into this fabulous dynamic center for arts, culture, recreation, small business, artists. There's accountants in there. There's every kind of folk that's in there. And they interact with each other. You can get a cup of coffee, but you can also sit and watch a performance. And you can actually go and get a prototype done of something you've invented uh, in one of the most challenged neighborhoods in Paris. This is a, a fabulous journalist who works in the New York Times who writes so smartly about the economy. But what he talks about here is how we need to understand that the really smart uh, solutions and, and innovative concepts that come to communities come at the most local level. And he wrote a column uh, talking about how we should trim experts and trust the locals. And I love the phrase because it talks about harnessing this indigenous capacity that we know exists. 
So if we want to build the resilience of cities and we want to understand that communities that enable them have all sorts of opportunity, uh, need all sorts of opportunity, and have, have uh, in, innate capacity to be able to be innovative, here are some tips. We always want to be able to cross sectors and disciplines. We want to try to find a way for architects and engineers and artists to be able to speak to one another. Um, and part of that is an organization like mine that I work for, but there are many others around the world that are always bridging that social capital across difference. We also want to strengthen the assets of already existing communities because they actually, we have lots at our disposal. We have physical assets, civic assets, buildings that have been created for public use, and then we have the assets of the people that live there. How do we strengthen those? How do we connect those? How do we take data and democratize that? The cell phone technology world that you and I live in now is making that happen whether we like it or not. I've got access to be able to give you information and I've got ways to get information. It's a fabulous democratization of understanding how the city works. Similarly, we want to try to see if we can get decision making to flow down to that level so that if I and my community have a better idea about what should be done, I have the opportunity to actually implement it. Uh, and I think that these are all systems that are kind of slowly coming into sync with one another as technology drives and as the governance and the way in which we approach decision making also changes. So it's all about how we collaboratively work with people that are like us and think like us, but also people that aren't. How do we create that relationship with the other? And one of the critical things about this are feedback loops. If you look at cities that are challenged, often it's because there's been a disconnection on a feedback loop. So environmental decision making wasn't matched up with an economic decision making, or the uh, cultural community was isolated, or there were other kinds of ways in which we weren't actually allowing those feedback loops that naturally want to function, that we were inhibiting them somehow. So I'm reminding you that if you look around you, you will see that that kind of interconnection exists everywhere. And you can see it in the new economy. Look at how Craigslist organizes. It's a fabulous self-organizing system where you and I exchange and barter and provide goods. Similarly, there are new ways for art and artists to help us see cities differently. This is a wonderful pilot from Bristol where artists got involved in helping me as a person walking in that city to actually interact with uh, lampposts. Look it up. It's a fabulous project. Uh, in Bandung, Indonesia, um, the reason we know about these is that we're cultivating a network of practice to talk about how we all contribute at the hyper-local level to resilience and livability in our cities. And in um, Bandung, uh, at the Creative City Forum, they have these wonderful initiatives where they uh, connect people directly with the natural environment and the natural assets and resources in that city through imaginative kinds of things. And the Bandung city, uh, Creative City Forum are people like you and me. They're not architects or planners or specialists. They're people who inhabit the city and who want to help uh, make it work for everybody. Here in, uh, in, in the Northeast of the United States, after a, a big storm we had last fall, um, we saw an enormous outpouring of community res response. And one of the interesting things there was something called Occupy Sandy. These are mostly young people who came with all the skills that they have around technology and created networks of support and mutual aid. Um, to help folks that were directly affected by the storm inundation of Sandy. A great example of self-organization. We see it also in things like Airbnb and all the ways in which the sharing economy is becoming more and more part of how we function in large cities. We don't all need to own a car. We don't all need to have uh, uh, extra hotel rooms. Maybe we have other ways that we can share tools, food, different kinds of ways that we can build our capacity collaboratively. And Airbnb is a good example of that. Uh, and sure enough, didn't they make themselves available after Sandy to make sure that they could house uh, people that couldn't find hotel rooms? There are many, many stories that illustrate this kind of community-based response. And so what I'm suggesting when we talk about building the resilience of communities and cities, what we need to always be doing is harnessing the local, empowering the local, providing resources to the local. We really need all hands on deck. We can't wait for some big super solution to come from government or to come from private business. It has to be all of us working at the hyper granular level, and then we need to find ways to stitch that together and create a relationship amongst all those initiatives. So part of what we emphasize here at the Municipal Arts Society is that it's about people and it's about providing an opportunity to put all hands on deck, that resilience needs to be cultivated at the hyper local level. And then we need to find ways to ramp that up and connect those initiatives. And one of the ways that we're connecting it is by reaching out to our colleagues um, around the world who are also uh, building uh, different kinds of initiatives. So as I suggested, Bandung, they're doing interesting things there. There are practitioners in Paris doing interesting things in Mumbai, in Rio, in Nairobi, in London, in Toronto, 
uh, and here in New York. And so we have established something called the City Builders uh, Network, which is about how practitioners, people like you and me, working at the hyper-local level to make our cities more livable and resilient. And so I hope you'll continue to, to uh, track us and enjoy that and participate with us and become part of the City Builders Network because we're actually the ones that make the city livable and resilient.